Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Holmes Cooney, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. It was a given that whoever succeeded Muhammad Ali as heavyweight champion would suffer by comparison in the public eye. That Larry Holmes was more a technician than a lightning bolt, more a worker bee than a cult icon, only made his road to glory that much rougher. And when a power-punching New York-based Irish-American challenger came along to face him, it was perhaps written in American granite that their confrontation would be not just about hurt, but also about hope, white hope. This should be one whale of a finish. All the marbles on the line. Go. On June 9, 1978, at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, a 28-year-old heavyweight, best known for being Muhammad Ali's sparring partner, began the 15th round of his bout with heavyweight champion Ken Norton, dead even on the judges' scorecards. The 15th round of the world heavyweight title is on the line right now. One round, winner take all. Larry is fighting back really now. This is what he has to do. See if he's got enough left to take the champ out. I used to tell people that I won't be heavyweight champ in the world. And they said, Larry, you ain't gonna make it. Scores good with a shot to the head of Kenny Norton. Again to the head of Norton. They said, I have no heart. As Holmes comes back, scores a good shot. He's got under trouble. Yes. Running out of time. And that's it. It's all over. Nothing you watch. We have a split decision for the new Larry Holmes has done it! We have a new heavyweight champion in the world! Larry Holmes, seventh grade dropout from Easton, Pennsylvania, would begin the second longest reign as heavyweight champion in the history of boxing. Seven and a half years, fighting in the wake of a legend for a respect he would always find elusive. I defended my title over 20 times. Larry clips him with the right hand, and down he goes. Didn't doubt anybody. And retains the heavyweight championship of the world. I wasn't getting respect that I thought I should have got. Larry Holmes was one of the great heavyweight champions ever. Yet, through all his career, it was very cold in the shadows where he was living because Muhammad Ali was still a champion in the eyes of the public. Civil rights figure, loud, brash talker, braggart, made Ali the most charismatic and colorful fighter that ever lived. And here, Larry Holmes, who's in a lunch pail, blue collar guy, he doesn't nearly have the fire that Ali had. He was the forgotten heavyweight. Nobody knew who he was. I have to con convince you day in and day out, there is no one in the world today could beat me. I went into an Allentown fair with him in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and he was introduced as George Foreman. I get called more Joe Frazier than I did George Foreman. <laughs> I have 29 medals with 39 fights, with 11 title defenses, with 10 straight knockouts. Holmes was not a larger-than-life figure. He didn't have a dazzling style. He didn't have a dazzling personality. He was just a really good prize fighter who was the heavyweight champion of the world. Dazzling personality or not, by 1982, Holmes had beaten everyone in his way, including a pummeling of the great Ali. But there was one candidate left for him to take on, an undefeated Irish kid from New York, who looked like Rocky Balboa, and supposedly had a left hook like Joe Frazier. So I think that a lot of people related to me in The Underdog. It was like the Rocky story being lived. The New York City suburb of Huntington, Long Island, had never before been a breeding ground for heavyweight contenders. Then again, for a steel worker named Arthur Cooney, it really didn't matter where he moved his family. His son, Jerry, would be a fighter. My old man was a tough guy, and he always wanted to be a fighter, and unfortunately, he never could be, so he kind of built a ring in the backyard, and he used to box with us himself. My father hit me probably the hardest I've, I got hit a couple of times. He told me his father would get him up in the morning and make him run through the dark streets of Huntington. When other kids could do different stuff after school, he had to go get on the train and go to New York to the gym. His father made him feel like crap. Ah, you're a bum. You're no good. You'll never be anything. Boxing was a way for me to express the anger I felt from the house I grew up in. It made me somebody. 
and it fed me and it kept me alive. Let's work in this guy. Let's break this night guy's neck. Come on. Working with trainer Victor Valley, Cooney turned professional in 1977 and hired as his managers a pair of Long Island real estate moguls named Dennis Rappaport and Mike Jones. They were boxing novices who'd quickly earned a reputation and a nickname, the Wacko Twins. We got the nickname the Wacko Twins from some very creative things we did for publicity. We had a fight of Ronnie Harris. Ronnie was black and he wanted to fight with a yarmulke and claimed he was a black Jew. With Howard Davis, we had him give uh, long stem roses to his opponents. With Jerry, we brought leprechauns into the ring to put hexes on the opponent. In the game of boxing, they were very much within the cultural mainstream of that sport because it's a wacko sport. You couldn't stop Rappaport from talking with a gun, a whip, and a chair. There's a love affair taking place today between America and Jerry Cooney. It's so profound it'll make people forget an affair to remember. He was one of those guys you talk to and you kind of touch all your wallet and all your parts just to make sure everything's still there. There's mom, apple pie, and Jerry Cooney. He cared about what was going into his pocket and how quickly he could get it there. Jerry Cooney, I think he was kind of a product. A product that rarely appeared in heavyweight boxing. A product that history taught them was better than gold. Jerry Cooney is a white fighter. The great white hope always sells. It just so happens that the vast majority of people in this country are white. And the fact that there's yet another black heavyweight champion in the world is not nearly so interesting as the fact that there is a white guy out there who actually punches like a wrecking ball. They had the perfect product for them to put before the consumer and they were playing it for all it was worth. The product began his pro career with a string of quick knockouts that garnered plenty of notice, but left most grizzled boxing scribes skeptical. He might as well have been fighting unemployed shepherds and vacationing streetcar conductors when you look at the line of guys he fought. First round knockout for Jerry Cooney. Well, I think he made believers out of a lot of people when he fought Norton. Welcome to Madison Square Garden. In May of 1981, Cooney faced a legitimate threat in Ken Norton, the man Larry Holmes had beaten for the title three years earlier. It was on this night that Cooney won over many of his critics. And I'm figuring this guy's sort of built like a monster, I'm in trouble, and I get into the center of the ring and I think to myself, man, he's not that big. A right hand luck of the knees of Norton. Took him out 54 seconds. With combinations of left stands one straight out. It was brutal. When Norton slumped into that corner, I've seen fighters die in a ring, and it wasn't unlike that. After that fight, he became legitimate. And he was white. When had there last been a respected white heavyweight champion? Rocky Marciano, three decades before. For the media, it became a part of the narrative. Do you resent the fact that people make a special deal out of you perhaps becoming a white champion in a black-dominated sport? Well, I think that uh, in today's time, it's sad that the people are going to label other people. And I, I never that, thought about the white hope and that kind of media. thing. It was just never a part of myself. I was knocking everybody out. I deserved the shot at the championship. And I never thought about that. But everyone else was thinking about it, especially promoter Don King, who was determined to match his champion with the White Hope and to promote it as a race war. So Don likes to say the only color he pays attention to is green. For the money, race sells. It's a white and black fight. Any way you look at it, you cannot change that. Jerry Cooney, Irish, white, Catholic. Here you have an Irish American against an African American. And it was a very effective sales hook. But first, King and Rappaport would need to strike a deal for what would become the richest fight in history. As they began negotiating about for 1982, Rappaport demanded terms no inexperienced challenger had ever received before. Complete financial parity with the champion, an even split of $20 million. We had the attraction. Larry couldn't put rear ends in seats. Jerry Cooney could, not because he was white, but because he was right. Jerry had the right complexion to get the connection. Out of four, four black guys, the one that made the money. I fight one white guy, make all the money. But it didn't take long for the money 
and the massive attention Cooney was receiving to begin to gnaw at the proud champion. If the man was black, he wouldn't be nowhere. You know it, I know it, everybody know it. Jerry Cooney's a white hope. I said they hope I don't kill his ass. And if he come in here today, I'll punch him in the mouth for free. I mean, he was a nasty guy. I was more reserved, quiet, and he was more aggressive, you know, yelling and screaming. I tell it like it is. And come June 11th, I promise you, Jerry Looney Cooney will be knocked out. It was ugly because everybody was talking about the white hope. When a black guy fights a white guy, it's automatic. Automatic or not, the people who stood to gain the most from the racial hostility were only too happy to pour oil on the smoldering fire. The people that handled this fight turned it into racial dynamite, and Dennis Rappaport was largely responsible for that. I do not respect Larry Holmes as a human being. I don't think he's carried the championship with dignity. Between Don King and Dennis Rappaport, listening to the two of them shrieking at each other, they were a circus. I found it contemptible when anyone would use the race card. Larry translated everything into black and white. If it wasn't a black-white situation, Jerry Cooney wouldn't be sitting up here talking about multi-million dollars. I felt discriminated against. I felt discriminated against everywhere I went. People shot in my windows, blew my mailbox up. Once everybody congregated in Las Vegas, it was ugly. It really got ugly and it really got base. We have to have press conferencing segments now in separation because the two gladiators, the champion and the contender, they can't be on the same podium at the same time. There was real bad blood between the camps. There was a battlefield, like getting ready for war. There was that type of tension. And we weren't going to be intimidated. This fight at some point in this hype began to get out of control. Fearing an outbreak of violence between the fighters and their entourages, Holmes asked the Reverend Jesse Jackson to help quell the tension. It got beyond a great boxing match between an up-and-coming young fighter who was white, a champion who was black, into the social overlap. And my appeal was, let Larry and Puna fight in the ring, don't you fight outside the ring. It was tense all across the country. And it was one of the hottest days I can recall. Boy, it was just a steam bath in Las Vegas. It reminded me a little bit of the day in uh, the Spike Lee movie, Do the Right Thing. We all know what happened at the end of that movie. It is the mecca for the world of lavish entertainment, a showcase for the top names in show business. The months of racial exploitation leading up to the bout certainly proved positive for the promoters. By June 11, 1982, the Holmes-Cooney fight had become one of the most anticipated events in modern sports history. WBC heavyweight champion Larry Holmes defends his crown against the number one contender, Jerry Cooney. It grossed more money than any theatrical opening, than any Super Bowl. Broke every record at the crap tables and the roulette wheels and in the casinos. To be sure, the heat here in Las Vegas has been oppressive, but the 100 degree temperatures that we recorded on our own thermometer ringside here at Caesars Palace just a little bit ago are nothing compared to the heat of anticipation that has surrounded this heavyweight championship fight. I don't think I've ever been around a fight where the opinions were so divided. There was a, a whole undercurrent of anger. You just feel people choosing sides. Just as blacks identify with heroes like Jackie Robinson and Muhammad Ali, white people occasionally invest in a Vince Lombardi or a Jerry Cooney. I felt a palpable feeling of danger out there. I have to think the public sentiment right now is toward the challenge of Jerry Cooney. And there were some threats that Cody would be shot or Holmes would be shot. You look at what is certainly a spectacle here at Caesars Palace. This is Jerry Cooney, the challenger, coming into the ring. I remember walking out of the dressing room and looking up and seeing snipers on every roof. Jerry Cooney comes into the ring. He does look relaxed, but at the same time, he has a rather stern look at his face. All the other nonsense that took place beforehand didn't mean anything. I wanted to show him that he wasn't a better man than me. Larry Holmes comes in here having won 39 fights without a loss. 29 of those fights coming as knockouts. He ain't a white hope to me. He's just another guy out there trying to take my head off. The hype was finally over. And it was time for the two undefeated heavyweights to get it on. Yet before the referee would give his final instructions, the champion, who longed for respect, would be tweaked one more time. Introducing, in the red corner, defying decades of boxing tradition, the champion 
was introduced before the challenger. The undefeated heavyweight champion of the world, Larry Holmes. They wanted to introduce me first, and they did. They didn't want to give me the credit, and they did. I've never seen it in any other championship fight that I've ever done. That just further fueled the fire for Larry Holmes. And fighting out of Huntington, New York. Everybody knew why. They were doing it to give Jerry Cooney's fans a chance to build up, build up, build up, and drown out the cheers for Larry Holmes. Gentlemen, Jerry Cooney. That was absolutely despicable. the center of the ring and Mills Lane said touch up he looked at me and said Holmes did and said let's have a good fight Shake hands now. Let's get it off. And the bell ring all the bullshit goes out the window there is electricity I realize that that may be a cliche but there is simply no other way to describe what is happening right now it's me and you you can't call the cops Round one, the heavyweight championship of the world, the most anticipated fight in years. Because so many of his fights ended in quick knockouts, Jerry Cooney wasn't used to going more than just a few rounds. But as this 15-round championship bout began, going the distance weighed on his mind. I was thinking, oh boy, I better go slow, make sure I can go the distance in case I have to. And that really affected me. Holmes all business with the jab right now. And Holmes was fighting such a disciplined, tight fight. Holmes being very patient. He was absolutely determined that he was not going to give Cooney a chance to land a big punch. The first big punch wouldn't land until late in the second round. It was thrown by the champion. One, two, right on the chin. And Cooney took a good right hand from Holmes. He staggers and is down. Cooney is down from a right hand by Larry Holmes. I get dropped to one knee and I think to myself, what in the hell are you doing here? And I got up. He is back up, but he is on rubber legs. And he gets up, the fight harder. <laughs> he gave him a lot of respect, he gave Cooney. He thought, you know, wounded tigers are dangerous. He didn't want to get too close. End of round two, Larry Holmes would be very patient after he had his man down. Obviously, he didn't think he was hurt that bad. In the corner between rounds, Dennis Rappaport attempted to inspire Cooney with words that reminded many of the pre-fight racial ugliness. Who is the guy in the corner who looked at Cooney during the fight and said, America needs you? In the changing of God, America needs you! He wasn't talking about Harlem, I'm sure. That's BS. I was saying things that I thought that could prompt them to get that little extra effort that may have been the difference between the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Cooney responded in the fourth with one of his best rounds of the bout. A good left to the body, backs Holmes up. That was a right hand to the ribs that seemed to hurt Holmes. Another good left hand. Cooney with another good left to the ribs of Larry Holmes as the bell sounds ending the fourth round. He hurt me with a left hook to the body, and I went back to the ropes like death. And Holmes a little bit slow going back to his corner. Thank God that the bell went ping. There's a right hand by the champion and another right hand. The longer the fight went on, the more we saw the distance between the two fighters. And a combination that time by Holmes scores once more on Cooney. One fighter was a complete pro. The other fighter was an incomplete pro. Holmes comes back with a right hand and the legs wobble once more. Cooney is in trouble against the ropes. Now a left and an uppercut. Cooney goes through the rope, but is still on his feet. Hard right by the champion. Holmes scoring almost at well, but Cooney will not go down. End of the round, a big round for Holmes, but Cooney would not fall. By round nine, as Holmes was gaining control of the fight, Cooney would throw the most memorable uppercut of his career. There was a low blow thrown by Cooney. Rob Williams said it was the punch that was felt around the world. 20 years later, I still feel it. Cooney would eventually have a total of three points deducted for low blows. By the end of round 12, he was also badly cut and fatigued. After the 12th round, I thought to myself, you know, I really can't win. I started to lose hope. And then I wanted to just show him, listen, you can't hurt me, man. 13 round, the punches go boom, 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 headshots. 
Cooney very wobbly in the center of the ring. Takes another right hand. Holmes knows he has his man in trouble. Another right hand. The body will fall if that head gives up. This one is all but over. Cooney against the ropes. Mills Lane steps in. And Victor Valley is saying no more, I believe. Victor Valley is in the ring saying no more. That's it. Victor Valley, to his credit, really cared about Jerry Cooney. He didn't want to see me get hurt. It is over. And Mills Lane raises Larry Holmes' hand in victory. Jerry Cooney fought his ass off that night. Whatever he had, he left in the ring that night. And he just fought a guy who was just so overwhelmingly better than he was. Larry Holmes had paid his dues. Holmes' victory was a victory for professionalism. The winner, and still the WBC heavyweight champion of the world, Larry Holmes. The 13th round technical knockout was Holmes' 40th straight victory without a loss. But to the champion, it meant much more than just preserving an undefeated record. I feel relieved. I felt the pressure was gone. In my heart, my mind, I felt that I didn't have to prove anything anymore. Larry Holmes believed beating Cooney was going to be his moment. But it wasn't. For much of America, the wrong guy won. So it wasn't a crowning moment anymore. There was never going to be a moment for Larry Holmes. But he never, ever got out of the shadow of Muhammad Ali. I felt disappointed and let down. What are your feelings about tonight, your personal feelings? Should have ducked a little more. I wish I would have won. I've been away from home a long time. And I think that the people were great. And uh, I wanted to win for them as much as I want to win for me. I just won 13 rounds for, for the heavyweight championship of the world. Of course it was emotional. It's a tough night. Long night. He really felt he had let down so many people. And I feel sorry for for all the people that really wanted me to win. I think so much pressure was put on him that he was carrying a load for a large portion of America. I just want to say I'm very sorry. Cooney made a huge payday, one of the biggest in the history of boxing, but he never seemed to have to stop apologizing for his performance. It seemed to scar him psychologically. Listen, I grew up in a household where I learned five things from my old man. You know what they were? You're no good, you're a failure, you're not going to amount to anything. Don't trust nobody and don't tell nobody your business. When I lost to Larry Holmes in 1982, I felt all five of those things smack me right across the face. How to deal with them? The loss sent Cooney's career into a puzzling tailspin, marked by substance abuse, depression, and lack of ring activity. He would only fight five more times before retiring in 1990. George Foreman blows away! Jerry Cooney was a product of everybody else's ideas and other people's money and other people's perceptions. He's a guy who just sort of showed up, became bigger than life, and then just kind of went back to being what he was in the first place. It's just a good guy sitting on the next bar stool. 15 rounds of boxing for the WBC Heavyweight Championship of the World. The fighters remembered sort of like a passing tornado. Something bad happened, something dangerous happened, and it's gone. And maybe we're still trying to figure out what it was. America went into the fight choosing sides, black against white. It played to the worst and to the best. It played to the worst in, in those people that accepted this fight as a black-white fight. It played to the best to those people who saw the artistry of Larry Holmes and the courage of Jerry Cooney. Put them all together and you had the heavyweight carnival to end all heavyweight carnivals. We can only hope that as a country we've come as far as have Holmes and Cooney who can now be seen as friends. Cooney has organized a foundation aimed at creating after-career opportunities and financial help for retired fighters. And Holmes makes frequent appearances on behalf of Cooney's foundation. Thanks for watching The Tale of Holmes Cooney.